Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest Guy Finley, and he's here today to share with us his new book, Relationship Magic, Waking Up Together. Guy Finley is an internationally renowned spiritual teacher and best-selling self-help author. He is the founder and director of the Life of Learning Foundation, which is a nonprofit center for the transcendence of self-study located in Oregon. He also hosts the Foundation's Wisdom School, an online self-discovery program for seekers of higher self-knowledge. He is the best-selling author of The Secret of Letting Go and about 45 other books and audio programs, and he sold over 2 million copies in 26 languages worldwide. Today, Guy is going to share with us his latest book, Relationship Magic, Waking Up Together, which applies decades of spiritual wisdom to practical relationship challenges, which transforms any relationship from mundane to magical. So join me in welcoming Guy Finley to the show. Thanks, Marianne. I'm happy to be with you. Oh, what a pleasure it is to have you here. And this book, oh my goodness, it is such a game changer for relationships. I mean, once I picked it up, I could not put it down. Uh, how, how much do I like to hear that? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will. I've got a lot of questions here for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, and yeah, you know, why don't we start at the beginning? Because, man, you're this great author that's you've written so many books and sold billions of copies all over the world. What inspired you to write this book? Oh, <clears throat> in the end, every book that I've ever written across that gamut of basically spiritual topics has been about relationship. After all, what is the real ground of every moment in our lives where we learn something about ourselves that changes us, ideally for the better, if not a moment of a revelation produced by a relationship we're in in that moment? So that relationships are really the the source in one respect, at least the expression of it, of of everything that we're ever going to learn about ourselves. And even more importantly, and to the point of the book, that every one of these revelations that we are willing to receive if we are, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Well, the teacher is is relationship, and specifically, it is the love that is binding us in these relationships that, that teaches us everything we need to know about ourselves so that we can be truer, better, brighter, wiser men and women. God, can we use more of that? You know, <laughs> relationships, it seems like when people, you know, in work, in just in relationships with other people, in their love relationships, that that is sometimes the toughest thing to not only understand, but to, you know, to work through and work with. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a real crucible in the true meaning of the word where, you know, mortal and mortar and pestle, you know, you, you, you learn gradually if you're going to have a successful relationship that your partner isn't in your life uh, simply to please you. Your partner is in your life to help you discover, me discover, the rough edges, the limitations, the places where we, without knowing it, meet each other with unconscious expectations, if not demands, that one another uh, be all things. You know, uh, the consoler, the the, the contentment, uh, the, the creative, the spontaneous force. And then when our partner fails to live up to what we have brought with us into that moment, then we find fault with them. And, of course, when we find fault with our partner, naturally they find fault with us for finding fault with them. And then 
uh, to use the metaphor, you're standing on a great big fault. Uh, the earth opens up and you both fall into that darkness of, of blame and shame and all the other things that we do uh, without really understanding it to try to make our relationship into what we've imagined it should be instead of letting the relationship be what it's intended to be, which is a mirror, a way in which we learn about ourselves, about our partner, and about the love that brought us together that has really a greater intention, a greater purpose than we can perceive at first, but that, again, my book helps spell out. Well, you brought something up a little bit ago when you were you know, describing relationships, and we talked about limitations. So when there are limitations in relationships, where where do those come from? <clears throat> well, let, let's 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 look at it. I'll try to bring it right down to earth. Um, let's say that you're in relationship with someone, and uh, you're out to eat or something like that. And I don't know. You, we can all find a, a thousand instances, but. Just as an example, you're out with someone, and uh, I don't know what, maybe they reach over and take a French fry off of your plate without asking. <laughs> <laughs> this is personal now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, this, this is the fighting words right there. Yeah, I mean, you, you get the drift. You know, somebody uh, does something that actually is inconsiderate in a way, other than, you know, maybe... Uh, Long-time partners have that established, you can have what I have business, but sometimes, you, you know, for no reason at all, an action that's no problem as a rule turns out to be very uh, irritating. So we, in that moment, look at our partner and we think to ourselves, the minute we have that negative reaction, all of these associations you know, you know they've, they've never really uh, been considerate. I, I wish they wouldn't do that. They don't need the extra calories. Any one of a thousand different thoughts that leaps into our mind when our partner does something that we see as being a limitation on their part, a fault. Now, the task, if we understand the relationship and the reason for it, is for both of us to grow to have a deeper, more meaningful love that for our relationship with each other and in love, we realize aspects of ourselves that releases us from limitations instead of strengthening them. So in that moment, if we're all together still, we have a negative reaction about what our partner has done and see that moment as being a limitation on their part. Everybody on the same page, do you think, with us, Marianne, here? Mm-hmm. I think so. I think so without a doubt. It, it's interesting because, you know, there's so much more in-depth in regards to relationships when we think about it. <clears throat> and you, you bring up, excuse me, you bring up a way that most people never even consider, you know, in yes. regards to how to view relationships. But I think well, that, that's a needed way. Yeah, let me, so so to finish the idea about seeing their action and our negative reaction as being their fault and their limitation, what if we could understand that our negative reaction is part of the limitation in that moment? That we tend to look at limitation in a relationship as being the fault of our partner, but what if we could, and we must eventually, realize that no moment of limitation exists without both of us. That sure, my partner ought not take a French fry, ought not maybe go spend money that we can't afford, certainly should never abuse, which is another question we can get to. But the point is, is that my negative reaction is very much a limitation on the moment. And the moment is an opportunity to discover something about ourselves that releases us from limitation. So if I lash out or say something passively aggressive to my partner, am I not in that moment pushing against my partner's limitation with what I believe is my, my unlimited knowledge, my unlimited love, when the truth is I'm just enacting another limitation 
and crimping, pushing down on theirs. And we both know what happens when one person does something that's unwanted and then the other partner pushes back. Is there an opening there? Can anything new develop or is it part of a pattern? And if it's part of a pattern and it's a limiting pattern, then we have to be able to recognize that and do what we have to do as a partner to release ourselves first from our own limitation by recognizing it. And in doing so, create space so that instead of pushing back against our partner, we leave room for him or her to see that what they've done may be rude. They have a chance to learn because we're no longer burning and bringing them into our fire. Hmm. Well, and so overall, do relationships make us better people? Oh, yeah. It, well, 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 let's back up. Relationships make us better people or relationships make us more bitter people. The more we're able to use relationships to realize what is true about ourselves through the mirror of our partner, the better we become. We're released from old, concealed hurts, expectations and demands that we have that drag us and our partner down in those moments that they do. And we are better people because we're more whole. The more whole and happy we are, odds favor, the more whole and happy our partner will be because now we're not pushing them, making them jump through some hoop that we call happiness. On the other hand, if those moments in our relationships where someone does something unwanted produces in us nothing but instantaneous negative reaction, resistance, that in turn becomes demands, then not only do we become more bitter for their, uh, what do we say, because they're not living up to our expectations, but the more bitter we are, the more bitterness they taste and send the th same thing back to us. So there's no guarantee that a relationship is going to make us better. The guarantee is that a relationship is a mirror that we can learn how to use in which everything can be polished and made more true and beautiful between us and within us. I love that because you talk about in your book about taking responsibility for our relationships, full responsibility for our relationships. Yeah. And, you know, it really is looking at these parts of us that maybe we don't really normally want to look at. Yeah. <laughs> so that, look, it's so, to me, there's, there's nothing more beautiful than, than the kind of knowledge, higher knowledge, self-knowledge that we're, that we're uh, talking about and intimating when when we go someplace, I don't know, you live uh, on the East Coast, and I don't know if you're anywhere near the water. Uh, I live in the mountains. But all of us know what it's like when we go out in nature, see the ocean, see the mountain range, look at the fall leaves turning colors. Where I live in Southern Oregon, I've basically hand-raised five generations of deer so that Every morning, I, I get to hand feed all these beautiful creatures. Every moment of life like that, where nature allows us to be with her, in her, we have these marvelous revelations in ourselves about things that are balanced and gentle and beautiful, moving. And we love what nature reveals in us in those moments because she stirs in us something we don't know about ourselves ourselves until that moment. <clears throat> so when when I go outside, I'm not thinking to myself, I'm going to experience um, the strength of a buck, you know, a, a new a, a new what three point buck standing there, majesty embodied. But there he is, and standing there, I I can feel that buck. I can feel that strength. Now, we love those moments, don't we, Marianne? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yes. I mean, what can be better than nature stirring in us the revelation that already within us, that character lives? So we get to have that momentary uh, wondrous awareness that we already have in us all of these incredible 
characteristics. Now, are you ready for the other shoe to drop? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what happens when I'm with my partner and suddenly they rear up? Suddenly they look at me uh, and, and it looks like an attack mode or a, a, a cold shoulder mode or a cruel comment that bites. Why is that moment different than the moment in nature? Is not the same revelation occurring? Only in this instance, instead of my partner showing me this beautiful sensitivity, this tenderness that can't be known otherwise, other than through that particular relationship with my partner, why isn't the same thing true when my partner shows me that there's a pain in me? That there's something that has never healed in me. That there's a demand that I've come through time with that I never be spoken to in a certain tone. Because back when I was a teenager or in an earlier relationship, I was destroyed in a similar situation. Why wouldn't I accept that revelation as gratefully as I do the beautiful ones? Because if I can see the truth in accepting that revelation when the teacher appears, then I begin to recognize this relationship does more than just give me physical, emotional pleasure when everything's smooth sailing. This relationship is teaching me about my boat, about the places where there are weak spots, conditions guaranteed to collapse until, at last, what has been concealed is revealed and I have a chance to release that because I see it doesn't serve me anymore, not to mention what it does to my relationship. Sorry to go on so long, but it's such a, an important idea. It, it really is. And I think a lot of times when people are, they get so stuck in the emotions and the heat of maybe an exchange that they fail to kind of step back a little bit and go, what is this really about? Ah. Uh. Oh, am I reacting to something, or ah. is, is it, am I being triggered? Or they I really love that, yes. That, and, and look, we all can hear what Marianne just said and go, yeah, you know what? I got caught up in that moment, and God help me. I said the thing that even though I didn't want to say it, something in me knew it would cut like a knife. And yet there it was. I don't want to be that kind of man. I don't want to be that kind, that kind of woman. And yet there I was doing it again. So we, we, we come to a, a critical point where when we've had enough, both in the sense of quantity as well as quality of, of negative reaction, we can begin to ask ourselves certain things like as follows. There's a section in the book. Have... How many fights do we have to have with our partner? Whether it's a month, well, we don't usually fight within a month. Sex is too good, too many things still to talk about. But maybe later. How many fights do we have to have before we realize, you know what? This fight is doing nothing but hurting me and hurting my partner. How many times do we have to realize that Blaming our partner for our pain has never done one thing to heal the pain. Even if we've gotten, even if we've managed to get them to say, I'm sorry. Even if we reach some compromise, the seed of that fight remains intact. And until the seed is exposed and finally realized as being something that can never serve either of us, it will recede itself and recede itself and recede itself. And that's what we've been alluding to here. What is this unseen seed in my heart, in my partner's heart, that we will fight about what seems to be the topic at hand, when, as Marianne alluded, it's not really about that at all. It's like Russia and the United States, you know, putting proxy armies in Syria. We destroy the country to win a war that can't be won. This is what we have to begin to understand is going on, that we're fighting over what seems to be the momentary problem, but the real problem is much deeper than that. And, by the way, so is the promise 
of being perfected by that problem if we can understand it. Well, that's so interesting, and I'm so glad that you're expanding on that because it's, it's a place where we can all learn, you know, learn how to be better at relationships, you know, not with other people, but really in, in many regards with ourselves. Yeah. If Here's an example, listeners. <clears throat> Have you ever walked into a, a, a room, uh, maybe a family gathering, or just you're going to meet some friends, and you walk into the living room and where you're exper- expecting, you know, there's two or three girlfriends or, or boyfriends, whatever, and you're expecting to have a nice time, and you walk in the room, and all of us have had this, uh, walk into a restaurant meeting three people, and you sit down at the table, and you might as well have walked into an ice locker. There's a chill in the air. Do you know what I'm talking about, Marianne? Mm -hmm. Something happened before you got there. Someone said something, and everybody's sitting there stewing. Now, when you walk into a room like that, and everybody's negative, what tends to happen inside of us? Do we become this little ball of light dancing on a lake, or do we tend to immediately internalize the condition ourselves and, as a rule, fall into a a kind of mud, not knowing how we got there, but being pretty sure that we wouldn't be in that discouraged, uh, despairing state if it weren't for the people we were with? Follow me? Yep. Now, did those people, my family, my friends, did they create that feeling of negativity in me? Or did they reveal that I walked into that room with that possibility with me? Which did it, which is it? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> exactly. It's, maybe it's a little bit of both. <laughs> ah, that's what we're looking for. It's a relationship. Mm-hmm. They can't create something in me that wasn't there as a possibility before that moment. So really what that moment happens where suddenly I'm with some people and in a heartbeat I'm discouraged. In a heartbeat I feel as if I've been despaired in some way. Unless I brought with me some element in my unconscious nature that could immediately be brought to the forefront and when it is, rather than me seeing that these people have actually done me a service, they've introduced me to a limitation that I don't know that I have, and that the revelation of that limitation could go two ways, make me better or make me bitter. Make me better if I realize, you know what? Thank you. I didn't know that about myself. Or like Christ said, love thine enemies. Because in that moment, I'm introduced to something in my nature I didn't know was there, but that now I can see, always manage to show up somehow in situations like this, and now I get it. I've been blaming people my whole life for this pain, this despairing feeling, this sense of discouragement, this instantaneous sense of impossible, when the fact is, all they've done is work as teachers, revealing to the student I'm ideally speaking, the part of me that can see it and understand it. And then I stop blaming so that the arrow of my attention is no longer pointed at the person seen as responsible for my pain. Now the arrow of attention is turned back around within me and I begin to understand the true nature of responsibility, both in the sense of relationship and spiritually. Because now there's a chance A moment of change has come because the limitation is no longer being cast off as the responsibility of others. Now it's mine to see and mine to let go of. Well, on that note, we are going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Guy Finley in regards to his new book, Relationship Magic, Waking Up Together. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. 
Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit judygoodman.com. That's judygoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest Guy Finley, and he's sharing with us his new book, Relationship Magic, Waking Up Together. Now, before we went for break, I know, Guy, you did this fabulous exercise where no matter where we are in a relationship, if we're confused and not sure what's going on, we can just ask these simple questions and it will help put us on the right path. Yes, but here's the rub. Are you ready? Oh. It's such a beautiful, and that, you know, I just realized, you know, we, we look at that expression like, here's the rub, like it's a bad thing, don't we? <laughs> we do. Ah, what if the rub is a polishing cloth? <laughs> Sounds so much nicer then. <laughs> oh my God! You know, I, I, I all these years teaching, and I've never understood. Here's the rub. Of course, here's the rub. Why do I immediately blame other people for the pain that at least I can suspect now is part of my own unconscious nature? Why do I do that, Mary Ann? Yeah. And I'll leave it rhetorical because I don't know what to do with my pain. I don't know what to do with that moment when I feel the pain. The only possibility I know when a revelation pulls out of my consciousness something that's been concealed in it is to find someone to hang it on. But now we're beginning to understand a whole bunch of things. If people happen to be Christocentric or you know, oriented towards Christianity, love thine enemies. No greater love does a man or a woman have for the one he lays his life down for. All of these things take on a new meaning because for the first time, I start to get it. The real meaning, by the way, the ancient meaning of the word patience is to suffer myself. I have to suffer myself instead of make you suffer for the pain you've shown me lives in me. I have to suffer myself. And the beauty of that, which most of us don't think is beautiful, but I tell you it is, is that I get to see, you know what? All my life, I've let this part of myself point to you as being the problem. Now I get to see the problem firsthand 
And it's not you. You've simply awakened it in me. And if I will stay with that pain, that problem, I'll make the most glorious discovery in the world. It was never me. It was something that was carried over from a moment similar to the one I'm in, but that I entered into without knowing what I know now. And now because I know something different, I can attempt something different. I can see my partner and myself through new eyes because I have new eyes allowed to me by a new understanding. And the moment that I change in any respect, even in the smallest way, even if it's just to wish to see what we're talking about, the whole relationship changes, Marianne. It's, it's quantum physics, by the way. Change anything about the observed by the observer and the whole thing shifts. So in that moment of bringing new understanding into the relationship and attempting, if nothing else, just to understand the moment where before I thought I knew everything about it, suddenly there's room for change. And that's relationship magic. That is relationship magic. My goodness. And I love how you bring it down to quantum physics. I mean, you look at this, and it, it is true. It is the observer theory. When we look at what we're looking to have in, in life, it's much different unless people want to repeat what they've seen from other people yeah, around them, yeah. parents, you know, because that's usually all that we go out, you know, go off of. It's the that's exactly learned it. behavior that really didn't serve anybody. And the thing is, it's, not only is it conditioned, but because of the nature that can be conditioned, a lower unconscious, a lower unconscious level of ourselves, because it can be conditioned, part of its conditioning is to believe. That's it. That's all there is. <laughs> I know you're wrong. End of story. Accept my point of view, or I'm dropping the bomb. That's it. And when you have two people looking at each other through the old eyes, through the conditioned response born out of seeing mom punish pop, pop punish mom, the dysfunctional, addictive behavior, not just substance, which is eventually the step these things take when nothing can be resolved, but in the substance of that character in us that doesn't understand there are other alternatives but for there to be a new path, there must be a new perception. And that's what this book is about. A new way to see what we will find is true in ourselves. And if we do, a new possibility. And by the way, a new relationship with our partner. And really a new relationship with ourselves as well. Ah, yes, because it can't happen otherwise, can it? No, it cannot. <laughs> it can't happen in a vacuum. No, I mean, it's, it, <laughs> it will change everything. And you look at that and you're like, okay, this is, this is like fundamental, profound stuff, you know. It, it's stuff that we're not really, you know, we don't come with a user's manual, so we don't really know. But having yeah. your book really helps people to kind of look at relationships at a whole different level. I love that idea. A user's manual for people who want to know love that doesn't turn into its opposite. I'm pretty sure I didn't. I said part of that, but you made it sound way better. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, I just like the idea. <laughs> look, 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 everybody, we don't have to be Einstein or a saint mm -hmm. to understand that love doesn't hurt others. That love can't punish. That love would never limit. So when we have moments with our partners where there's something in us, whether we want to admit it or not, wants the other person to feel bad because of what they did, that's not love. Period. Love allows us, God willing, to see and understand that my partner is in pain like me. 
that my partner said that hurtful comment not because they were happy, but because something brought up a pain in them. So pain pushes, then pain blames. And when I'm the recipient of the blame of their pain, I'm suddenly in pain too. And then pain blames back. Pain feels like when it's blaming, it's trying to resurrect a love that was destroyed by our partner. Love never destroys. Love integrates. So the more we understand that it's not my partner's pain, it's not my pain, it's our pain in that moment, the more likely we are to agree to step back and try at least to witness something in us that's telling us, look, I'm hurting you because I care about you. What nonsense! Love doesn't punish. So something in me that's called itself love, by the way, that I saw mom and dad do, that, by the way, in their pain, lashed out and punished us as children. How many times were we punished in a rage of fit, if we were, and then told, this is for your own good. Maybe we needed correction. I know I did. I was a crazy kid. But the anger isn't part of love. The anger is the pain in our parents not knowing what to do with us when suddenly they feel threatened, an image they have of themselves, or just wanting the best for us, but not knowing what it is. So we get this grand, beautiful new view of, of, of a possibility of a love that has in it sacrifice before it has make the other self, the other person, step up and be what we want them to be. It's a whole new game, even though it's older than time. Yeah. And the thing is, is no one's really taken it to the level that you have to explain it, and you make it so easy to understand. And I appreciate that um, about the book. <laughs> you know, yes. the relationship, it, it's got these key lessons at the, at the end of every chapter. So even if I'm, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb all the time, and sometimes it takes me a while to get things. So I can read that and kind of get the a little bit more of a deeper understanding and yes. really kind of connect, you know. By, by working, Marianne, with it, even the last chapter, we learn that we're all in training. This life is not a race to win. It's a school for our higher education, for learning about the possibilities of a love that was seeded into us before we even had a body. So we get this, this great opportunity to you know, stumble forward, fall into these various pits produced by self-ignorance that we don't recognize as such, and then let the rub, the polishing, produce the new light, the new awareness, the new understanding. And then we step into the next situation where the teacher appears and we learn something newer and truer still. And, you know, I'm never going to look at the rub, you know, in the way that I have all my life. <laughs> I won't. I mean, when someone will will say, hey, there's the rub, I'll be like, oh, that's great. Is, yeah. Oh, <laughs> boy, Marianne, from your mouth to God's ears, may your wish come true. That changes everything. Mm -hmm. It changes everything. Look, can I ever be, a, can I ever be free to love everything? any other human being, if I have the smallest fear that something that human being may do will produce a pain in me, if I'm afraid that you have the power to limit me, to punish me, will I ever be free to give myself completely to that person or relationship? Wow. Hmm? I'll, I'll, I'll always hold the card in, in, in up the sleeve, won't I? There'll always be a reservation. But what if I understand that there is no such thing as a moment that isn't come to reveal, as the Sufis used to say, to polish the mirror? 
to pull back the veils, the illusion that somehow love can have in it a loss. Love never loses. If love seems to be missing in the moment of a relationship, it's not love that's missing. It's our understanding of what love can do if we place ourselves where it can prove itself to us. I love that. I absolutely love that. Because it, it really, it has us take a deep look at relationships and ourselves yes. and how we conduct ourselves in relationships and what we attach to. Yes. You know, if we're attached to outcomes or, you know, people should be a certain way or I should be treated a certain way, you know, it, it's interesting. <laughs> and, 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 and again, you're, the point's so well taken, Marianne. Look, we're not saying that suddenly we're going to get some kind of magic marker, you know, and, and, and boy, I get it, now I'm free. Mm-hmm. No, I get it, and now I'm going to begin the work that love has given me to do, which is to gradually realize where I thought this dependency produced by an attachment was something good. Now I understand. The attachment and the dependency may have been necessary in the moment. In fact, it was inescapable. But now I must transcend that identity that believes I'm only worthwhile as long as my partner proves it. Now I get to discover something is in me concealed that can only be healed upon its revelation, and then don't resist the revelation. Allow it to do what it has come to do, which is to prove to me, show me, this thing no longer serves me. And in those moments, in a relationship, we enter into that moment where there is a problem, a conflict, and if we use the moment for the purpose love has produced it, we exit that moment a different human being. And when we exit that moment, even 1% different than we were, than what went into it, because we've released something that was revealed, the whole relationship is different and stands literally on a new and higher level of ground where new possibilities present themselves. You know, you have a quote in your book that really stuck with me. And it's from St. John. I mean, you know, everyone yes. says, hey, I read the Bible, I should know this. But it, the way that you have it with, with everything that we've been talking about and the book itself, it just, it really hit home to me. It's perfect love casts out fear. And it was just, for me, that was such a powerful you know, those five words are so powerful. I just got a chill, and I wrote it. Not not John's passage, but the whole book is summarized in that. We have fear because we have attachments. No attachments, no fear. The attachments produce dependencies so that we look at our partner, our business, our mom, our dad, our lives itself, the, the, the ideas, the beliefs that we cling to. And they become dependencies so that if anyone or anything shakes the ground of what I am completely identified with and believe my whole life hangs on the balance of, then I'm filled with fear. Love reveals that we don't have to have attachments to be whole. Quite the contrary, that the more attachments we have, the more divided we are. A house divided cannot stand. So as the house is made whole by the revelations that love allows, fear is cast out. But the beauty of the revelation is that fear never belonged in the house to begin with, and that it was just a product of our misunderstanding who and what we are, and our purpose on this life as love has given it to us. Then everything starts to merge and reveal the thing was always united, but that we were apart from it due to our conditioning, 
due to a level of consciousness that, you know, look, it's nobody's fault. We're, we're born into a sleeping world. That's how my path began, Marianne. Honestly, age of five, six years old. I couldn't understand what was going on, but why are my parents, who, by the way, were very successful in the world, why are they so angry? Why do they drink? Why are they afraid? Why are people fighting? What's this about? Especially when you've got everything. And there it is. People, all of us, brought into a world where we're told that love is something that we, somehow or other, manage, control, or otherwise lose. The opposite holds true. We're not the managers of love. We're the instrument of it. And we don't control it. We're changed by it if we'll allow ourselves to have the proper relationship to it. Again, that's real magic. Because then we discover, really, there's nothing to become. There's just something for us to see in ever deeper ways. Hmm. Do you think that most people kind of suffer from this illusion of, you know, where they're um, reacting out of fear with anger and not able to really maintain um, kind of a center for themselves in relationships? Oh, yeah. Look, we all, look, it's so important to point out here that not one thing that Marianne or I have said is a judgment. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're, we're discussing reality. Yeah. You know, and the reality is that each of us does the very best we know how to do in the moment. The question is, do we have something in us that realizes, you know what, I could have done better than that. <laughs> and not because I'm comparing myself to some spiritual or religious morality, but because in that moment, I look, gosh, I don't want to get too personal, everybody, but I, you know, I'll, I'll speak for myself. How many times over the years, especially in my younger days, did I say something and missed seeing that I'd hurt somebody? If I could have seen, actually experienced, which we're created to be able to do, that in those simple words that I said that seemed to me so imperative to speak, I just crushed my brother's heart. If I could see that in the moment, I'd have conscience. Not my conscience, but the thing that binds all of humanity into the at least the possibility of transcending all of this unkindness that appears because we want to blame others for our conflict. So do I have the capacity to know what happens inside of my my mother, my father, my, my wife, in the moment where I cut them like a knife? Yes, I do. Am I willing to experience it? I hope so. Because if I can, in that moment, share the relationship instead of blame one for what it seems to be like, it's over. I'm not going to hurt my partner because I'm the one who's hurt first. I'm not going to say the, the trashy, thing to the person at work because I think they've thrown me in a pile someplace. Instead, I'm going to see, you know what, before I give you a serving of what I'm feeling, I'm going to taste it myself so that I don't give you what I don't want. Then things change. Yeah, then they start making changes. And I agree. I mean, I look back in my life and along my spiritual path, and you know, before I got to a point, man, I was, I was creating havoc wherever I went. And, you know, it's like been there, done that, you know. Because so I look at it, and I, you know, when you start to walk a spiritual path, the, the you, know, you, you kind of want to treat people nicer. You want to have yeah. nicer experiences. You know, you look back and go, gosh, what the heck was I thinking? I know. If we were smart when we were young we would have worn a sweatshirt that said warning content under pressure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. No, but no, consciousness, consciousness under pressure. <laughs> yeah, about ready. Yeah, that's right, Marianne. That's exactly right. 
Yeah, it, it's it's interesting where the journey takes us. My goodness, you know, Guy, I could talk to you all day long. You are such a light, and I'm so glad that you've written this new book. I love it, and I highly suggest everyone should pick up their own copy of Relationship Magic. Where can people connect with you and be part of your community? Well, let's see. Let's start at the beginning first. Um, if if the listener wants to write this down, relationshipmagicbook.com, relationshipmagicbook.com. Of course, all the major stores, chains, online stores have the book. But if you go to relationshipmagicbook.com and order through that link, it'll take you directly to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or eventually right to my foundation you will, upon ordering, be able to get free on the spot the audio book version, which I read. So you would get, when you buy the book through relationshipmagicbook.com, you can get a link, take you right to the audio book, download instantaneously. You also get two other gifts. One is a 60-minute, a, a I don't know whether it's an MP3 or an MP4, download on the spot, seven ways to have higher happier, more loving relationships, and a webinar, a free webinar, October the 28th, live streamed from my foundation where I teach in Southern Oregon, followed by a question and answer free streamed event sometime in the first week of November. I don't know the date exactly. The information's on relationshipmagicbook.com. So that's first. But if you don't want the book or whatever, but you still want to learn a little bit more about the work we're doing, just go to GuyFinley.org, www.GuyFinley, G-U-Y-F-I-N-L-E-Y.org, and uh, you can learn everything that you need to learn there. Uh, there's enough resources that you could spend years without paying a penny. And if you're ever in Southern Oregon, I speak three or four times a week to a group of men and women who either have lived, live here or come to, to take part in the in the teaching, uh, and it's a three dollar donation at the door. No one's turned away. That's it. Everything you need to know to follow up. Well, I've signed up for your um, webinar that's coming up. I can't wait. I also know that your book is available at all major, re you know, it's a Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and of course at all indie bookstores as well. Sure. If they don't have it, they can order it on the spot. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, and uh, and then connect with you. How great is that? You guys, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. I just, uh, sorry for the pun. It's not a pun. I loved the time together. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank uh, well, what's, you. What's better, what's better than a real conversation about what we all really need to understand? Nothing. It's like being with a real family. I could not agree with you more, Guy. I think that's a perfect place to be is around people who just love and empower you. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.